Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to Wellbeing Works. I'm Jim Woods, uh, talking to you from uh, a rather foggy uh, Oxford. I'm Zoe Eccleston, talking to you from a very sunny pool. So sunny, I've had to shut the blind this morning to keep the rays out. So, good morning. Well, lucky for you for getting the sunshine, Zoe. There's, it always seems to be sunny around you. Um, but listen, for, for the last couple of events, we've been really focusing on uh, how to support employees' well-being through choice, really through holistic um, support. And today we're looking more at kind of culture. Uh, we're looking at um, this concept of psychological safety. How do we create a culture where there's no fear, uh, where people can be themselves, where people can really uh, develop a sense of belonging? Um, <clears throat> and we're going to be asking some questions around, is this more important than ever? Um, is this going to shape how talent is going to move in the future? Uh, and we have um, two very interesting guests with us today. Uh, we have uh, Gareth Lee, um, who we've called uh, the mindful lawyer for today's show. Uh, and we have Oki Alazu, um, who is the chief operating officer of Bought by Many. Um, we'll run till about 9.10. Um, and at that point, we'll have a kind of a bit of a post-match digest for anyone who wants to stay around. Um, but Zoe, how's your month been? What have you been thinking? What have you been reading? Yeah, it's been a good month. I think it's been quite interesting to see that uh, now we've got some actually clear plans out of um, lockdown dates around when we can do things. I think people have um, enjoyed having a bit of structure. I think we all know that most organisations like to have an ability to plan. Uh, I think, as we've discussed uh, m most recently, though, it's been interesting because although I think a lot of people are doing a lot of planning behind the scenes as to how people are coming back to work, there isn't that much out there in the in the um, in the domain as to what people are actually planning to do. So uh, that'd be interesting to see, uh, you know, how people are taking it forward, what they're doing, thinking about people bringing people back into the workplace. Um, and I guess the other thing that's been quite interesting is the other change of shift um, over the last month is just this this idea that's going to be a huge war on talent because of the um, different ways we've all proved that we can work. Now there's the, the talent pool across the world is just open for grabs. So I think that's another interesting thing that we've, we've really started to notice in the last month or so. Yeah, oh, definitely. Well, <clears throat> I mean, we as a team have very much been thinking about what does, um, what does our kind of work and office life look like in the future and uh, and I think probably like every company we're starting to have that question and it's been really interesting to see just a plethora of different um, uh, opinions and desires from employees and, and it's going to be really interesting how we and so many other companies um, uh, approach that. Um, I am really interested in this kind of war on talent that you're talking about there and very conscious that as we come out of uh, a recession or a, this pandemic, um, we can expect, as always, a lot of movement in the labour market. Um, so, uh, yeah, going to be very interesting uh, months ahead. So, should I introduce um, Gareth Lee, our first guest? And I, and I should probably start by saying, um, Gareth has had a really big impact on our company. He came, he came in to do. Um, a, a talk which was ostensibly about mindfulness about um, two months ago. But in that talk, um, Gareth, he talked about this concept of psychological safety and it really resonated with me and with our team. It got, you mentioned an article in the New York Times, which I read, it'd be brilliant, uh, a book, uh, The Fearless Organization, which I have here, you, you referenced, I read that, and it, it's really actually impacted our company. And we, we had a value session last week um, where our second value is be fearless. And I'm not sure if we got there without you. So I want to say thank you. Start off with thanks for impacting us. Um, but, and great to have you here today. No, thank you. That, that is absolutely awesome. You know, I, I talk about many of these things, but to hear them or to hear that they're sort of being projected out of the slide deck and out of the session that we've, we've had together and, and actually taking roots in in real life that, that's brilliant so no thanks uh, thanks for that feedback and thanks for having me well it, it's an absolute pleasure i mean you, you kind of opened up this whole concept of psychological safety for us um 
And I, I wonder, could you just sort of um, talk about it, um, introduce it really here, and maybe talk about Project Aristotle, which you also talked about to us? Yeah, sure. Okay, so psychological safety, it's a characteristic of teams. Okay, so in a team with high levels of psychological safety, participants feel able you know, to be themselves, to bring their whole selves to work, to voice opinions without fear of judgment, to get things wrong without being labelled a failure. So that's the essence of it. It's this, this, this culture within a team where the participants in that the team feel, feel welcomed, feel able to, to be themselves. And Project Aristotle that you refer to, I guess that's the thing that, you know, that's really brought this topic to the fore. And it was, it was in 2011, Google decided to devote you know, a huge amount of its internal and, and not immeasurable analytical um, analytical powers towards finding what is it what is it that makes the best teams and what separates merely good teams from excellent teams and it looked at over 180 teams across 35 statistical models hundreds and hundreds of variables and they found out something really interesting in fact it took them a while to find it out because it wasn't obvious it wasn't intuitive to them they found out that that the individuals you know who's in the team what what they bring their background their iq etc it matters far less than how the team actually works together. Okay, the norms that operate within the team. And psychological safety of those various norms was found to be the most important factor. Okay, the very foundation of how the best teams are. And in fact, psychological safety leads not only to better performance by teams, but the, the, the scientific research has shown that it, that it improves the performance of individuals as well. And it, I mean, it's it, it's fascinating that it was the the kind of the X factor in terms of performance. So, what what were the other things they were looking at in that study? Uh, they, I mean, they started off with all the usual hypotheses. Is it is it that the stellar performers? Is it you know each of the individuals each brings with them the best score in their in their school exams, the best degrees, the best mix of different backgrounds? You know, I often think of like the the A team. You know, each one a specialist in some great discipline that they all bring together to, to sort of kill the baddies at the end. But that, as I say, that wasn't it. It wasn't about what each individual brought. It was rather how safe did these people feel when they came together. So it wasn't that other paradigms weren't important. It's just that this was, as I say, they, they described psychological safety as the underpinning, okay, the, the foundation. It's almost like the rest of it. Yeah, that's all good stuff. Of course, it matters to have goals, to have drivers, to have great people. But if you've not got this basis, you know, forget it. You're not going to gel. You're not going to work cohesively as that team to achieve your full potential. So I'm, I'm giving you space to come in if you want to. Yeah, thank you. So I think it's been interesting. It's been talked about for uh, you know a long time. Um, Amy's book was you know been out for a while that um, that Jim referred to. Do you think we you are seeing a shift towards psychological safety and how is it interlinked with well-being? Uh, do you think they go you know hand in hand or or what do you think about that? Yeah, so you're right. I mean, it's been around for ages, right? It's been around as a concept since the 1960s, but interest interest is growing, and I think it's growing. I mean. Look, clearly, I should I should put the disclaimer out there. You know, I'm, I'm not a, a scientific researcher on this topic. I'm rather a practitioner in the workplace who embraces embraces these topics, embraces these concepts. And I, I think it's risen in popularity partly because of the New York Times article that, that Jim referred to. So that's well worth looking up if you know if people want to see a nice summary, six seven pages or so on the topic. Uh, it was in 2016, and it's all about Project Aristotle. That's worth a look. I think partly it's rising in popularity because the body of research is growing and it's continually reaffirming what's been found. It's, you know, it's not detracting from it. It's, it's continuing to build this picture that this is something that matters. And I think it's partly um, rising in popularity because of its, its, um, its relevance. Right? So if we, if we wind back 30, 40 years, the norm would be that people would work far more independently. Right? So a lot more work done alone and in, in more routine tasks, right? where psychological safety really comes to the fore and really shows itself as a distinguishing factor in situations where you've got teams collaborating, getting typically on, on ambiguous, nuanced, grey issues, right? issues where you really do need to hear a perspective of views. You potentially need to fail right before you can succeed because you need to try stuff. 
you need to you need to not be afraid and that's the culture that we work in these days so i think i think it's more relevant than it used to be so that that's what i say about sort of why it's why it's risen in prominence in terms of the link to to well-being you know that they're, they're, they're clearly linked they're clearly linked in my mind at least because if you think you know, just logically what's what's the opposite of it right what's the opposite of feeling psychologically safe okay so feeling unsafe sitting there at work feeling anxious about getting it wrong feeling unwilling to offer your views because you're just not sure whether they're going to be viewed as relevant you know studies have shown for example that, that psychological safety can improve it can improve mental health it can improve and boost engagement and that's what companies are looking for right? employee engagement indices engagement engagement which also per positive psychological theory leads to happiness you know so there's all sorts of, of linkages and I'll, I'll give you just in a, in a nutshell one particular study that jumped out at me and I thought was was just perhaps more relevant to um, you know to, to showing a side of psychological safety that that could be really of interest um, particularly as, as perhaps more vulnerable people come out of this this crisis that we've been in right this was a study done in Germany in 2016 which looked at the impact of psychological safety both on Turkish workers in a German company and on German employees in that same German company. And what it showed was that psychological safety across the board, it promoted work engagement, promoted mental health, it promoted a lower turnover of staff. But really interestingly to me, it showed that the positive effects of psychological safety were greater for the Turkish employees than they were for the Germans in the same company. So just hinting at, at the sense that psychological safety may be even more important for the well-being of those in a, in a smaller minority or vulnerable group. That's a great example and the word that sort of springs to mind when you're talking about it is that sense of belonging, um, especially like you say, it's, it's a great, I've worked for global companies which are led from one, um, you know, a, a different country to perhaps the one where we were working in, and, and it is very obvious it's going to make a huge difference. I think I wonder if the other, um, we're going to see it increase even more given that we're all going to want a sense of belonging in whatever the um, back to the future looks like when we go back to work. So um, I wonder how you think that that will link in or, or any little top tips maybe of, of what we could do simply things for or you've given us some great ideas of what to read um, as we go into the next phase of hopefully returning to our old old norms yeah so I, I, my own personal view is that this is this is the way of the future I, I don't think people want to sit there anymore feeling disenfranchised feeling like they can't speak up like they can't engage and I think that's what certainly the younger people coming through are demanding I think employers are going to need to listen you know, and at the same time, why wouldn't they listen? As I said from Project Aristotle, it was clear, right, this, this improves performance. This isn't some sort of nice to have perk that costs me money. It's, it's absolutely win-win. And in terms of, I guess, tips for, you know, tips for how to grow it, right, well, well-being clearly forms a nice foundation. If you've got a company with good well-being, I think it would support an environment of psychological safety. I don't think it necessarily follows that psychological safety will just be there. I think it's a, it's a, it's a different thing. And I think look, as, as leaders, to the extent there are, are leaders on this call, and I think you know, we all are in some, in some respect, I'm not just talking about the line managers, but, but anyone who has influence with and when it, of other people, listen up, right? listen. It's often talked about as being this thing about speaking up, but people aren't gonna speak up if we're not listening. So I think my, my top tip, and, and indeed sort of the way it arose in the, the session that I was doing with Jim and his team, was it was around mindful conversation. So I'll, I'll always bring things back to mindfulness, but you know, we, we don't need that to, to explain the psychological safety link. This is about providing space for your people to talk and, and not judging or assuming that you know what they're saying, but, but genuinely listening, providing that space. And I think great things can, can flow from that. Yeah, yeah it's, it's super exciting hearing you talk about this and I, I <clears throat> it really, um, has been exciting for our team to go deeper into this um, concept and um, totally get what you were saying about minorities. We, we had unconscious bias training yesterday and we were, you know, looking at all the different words for ethnic minorities, black coloured, and, and lots of people in our team was finding different words difficult and we came to the conclusion there is no easy word but what we concluded was that actually if you have a culture of psychological safety 
you can discuss all these things and you can actually you, you can have that discussion if you don't have that psychological safety it's really hard to have have that conversation at all mm -hmm. um, but listen thank you so much for um uh coming along today um actually we well, there are some questions coming in and, and that's terrific there are questions coming in i didn't um say encourage them but i we absolutely would love it if you ask questions and there's a very good observation saying that um our plants in the background a, a well-being thing i'm sure they are um but we've got one question that gareth i was going to put to you before we let you go um, so <clears throat> it's from Suzanne Morning. We have really good psychological safety in teams, but not always across teams, which is leading to issues as our company grows. We've literally tried all kinds to make the creative process work better, but working from home has hindered this somewhat. What advice can you give uh, on trying to make this better? There's one very difficult question for you to handle before you go. Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a a good question right psychological safety exists at a team level as, as i said and as the question acknowledges and you know how do you define that team i'm sure there's an even bigger team of teams and of teams again right and it's, it's the leaders within those teams with whom this can start right? everyone's required it's not that you can have sort of one person not buying in and the whole team thriving psychologically safely that that won't work either but it really is the tone from the top so you know perhaps a, a practical takeaway would be if, if others are game and, and want to look at this, you know, perhaps have a, a sub meeting of, of the leaders across those teams to put it out there, you know, to have an honest conversation. I wanted to pick up on, on your last point, Jim, about how you were mentioning the, you know, the conversation around the, the, the terms used. It wasn't easy, but psychological safety enabled it. It's just a really important point, right? Soft skills, this is just fluffy. No. If you're doing it properly, if you're really embracing it, these are the hardest conversations you've ever had because you've been really honest. You're really putting yourself out there and being vulnerable. And I think that, you know, that's an important thing to take away. So bringing it to the question, perhaps, yeah, perhaps taking that opportunity to meet across those teams at a leadership level and really focusing on the question, how do we want to bring it? How do we want to, to then cascade that down and try to promote it? That might be a, a good starting point. Terrific. Gareth, thank you so much for dropping in. Thank you. Good. Zoe, I'm going to let you uh, introduce Oki. Morning, Oki. Oh, so let me introduce morning. Oki comes on. Good morning. It's nice to um, see you. Thank you for joining us this morning. So to everybody else, Oki um, uh, has a very impressive corporate record, having worked for um, quite a long time for um, Sainsbury's, has now become COO of uh, Bought by Many, uh, which is in a fantastic um, organization. Uh, as well as that, um, I think it's um, uh, as well as your commercial activities, you've set up and become founder of Black in Business. So I think it would be interesting, Oki, to start there. Why did you start that business? And then we'll move on to some other questions. Okay, um, morning, everyone. Um, the it, I kind of call it an initiative and it's kind of still in its very formative stages, but, but it was definitely in response to um, everything that happened last year and a kind of light bulb moment that, that I had um, forced by my 17 year old daughter. Um, because as you say, I've done very well in, um, in my career. I've been very lucky, um, very senior roles in big corporates and now, you know, um, CEO of, uh, you know, one of the fastest growing, tech businesses um, in Europe. And, and, and I kind of have always focused on what I needed to do to, to do my stuff. I'm actually not reaching down to help pull others up. And um, around the George Floyd Black Lives Matter movement time, um, my daughter, as, as these lovely 17 year old daughters do, um, said, Dad, what have you done <clears throat> to help? What have you done to make a difference? And, and I kind of thought well I've done loads and then I really thought about it and I thought well I haven't really done as much as I would like to have done um, or even thought about doing um, but I'm very live to this issue of being often the only um, black leader it's in insurance uh, in a, definitely in a management team often in a whole sector you know um, when I turn up to events and I thought well hang on a second really I, I, I need to do more right I need to do more and I actually have the ability to do more because I have good connections in big corporates and stuff. And, and I honestly believe that, that, that if we can fix the issue um, of, of, of racism or being anti-racist at a business level, we will have fixed it mainly almost, you know, not entirely, 
but in large chunks for the whole of society. So if we can get businesses to to really focus on on, on this whole um, um, diversity and equity and inclusion agenda, I know they're talking about, it, but seriously trying to fix it in all those one organisation at a time. Actually, in in ten years or twenty years, um, we may not still be having this exact same conversation. I think it's given what we've just been talking about with Gareth, I think it's a beautiful example of clearly you've got psychological safety at your dinner table, your 17 year old daughter decided to raise that. And I think it, to me, it just demonstrates beautifully that we need one of everybody to stand up and ask a question exactly like that maybe of her father i'm glad she felt safe to ask that but it can really change the dialogue um i don't know what you do whether you feel that that has translated into your business and you can see that coming through of similar examples well it's, it's really interesting because um look she's 17 year old she feels very strongly about lots of things um certain strong opinions weakly held sometimes um but this one strongly held um but actually i, I was reflecting on 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 the conversation um that, that you just had and the whole idea of psychological safety and the word fearlessness and i kind of i kind of i'm going to be maybe controversial i kind of have a small issue with fearlessness because i've always thought of fearlessness meaning not having no fear which is fine but actually fear you get good fear and bad fear right fear is kind of what keeps us safe too and fear is what stops people doing being reckless because they, they have some fear. So I, I think sometimes you talk about fear as a bad thing. And generally, I think it can be and it's not very mindful and, and so on and so forth. But, but I kind of think about, uh, I, I don't think of, say, Ruby or anyone in the business who wants to speak out about something, necessarily being fearless, but as being brave and courageous. And for me, brave and courageous is having fear and the ability to move through that fear to speak up, to challenge to you know it's not like I don't care I've got no fear it's about I have the fear I do worry that my but I'm willing to go past that and and in the space of inclusion and belonging and the whole idea of allyship we've spoken to lots of people now in many businesses and who've who felt bad about stuff and, and and when you talk to them they say I just think I should have done more I should have stepped forward I should have said something and you say why didn't you do that and and it comes back to fear so it's it would be great to have fearlessness organisations. So I'm not sure that, that I, that's not ideologically just too big, but I think it's great to create an environment where people can be brave um, and mm -hmm. step forward and feel the ability to, to speak out. I, I really, um, I mean, I think that's really interesting that you called it out because I think uh, words are always complicated when you have to choose one to sit by because I'm sure, and I can't see many questions coming in. And as Jim said, please do write your questions in because there will be other people saying the complete opposite is should we have to be brave in order to have psychological safety? Should it just be the norm? I'm not disagreeing with you. I just think it is interesting and whatever works within our organizations in order to be able to step up and be able to say those things, I think you make a great point. It's always that piece that stress has become a word in our in our well-being that is seen it always as bad. But exactly as you called out with fear, stress is really quite important. And actually what makes quite a lot of us act and go to work is having a pressure so I, I really um, appreciate you calling out that um, that word um, you know and your differences and it'd be great to have a discussion at the end of to what other people think um, moving on um, a, a little bit around the idea of whatever we call it in our workplace how what does it mean to you um, in your business uh, Thought by many around having the ability to, um, you know, where people can bring them their whole selves to work. What does that look like? And and has the pandemic and the op, you know, the different ways of us all working at the moment made a difference? Yeah, I think I think it's incredibly important. Um, we've just written a new statement. Well, we call it an inclusion strategy, but a statement within that about and and has the words, the ability for people to bring their whole self. You know, um, I, I believe hugely both in diversity, um, physical diversity, but also diversity of thinking. You know, um, if you read Matthew Side's book, Rebel Ideas, he talks a lot about actually not just diversity being much more than, than, than colour and race, but with that, the ability to think differently and take different angles on things. And um, we've, we've always believed that um, if we could, we can collectively solve problems. Okay, you know this whole ad, adage of 
of, of, of loving the problem. And as a business, from when we started to where we are now, and certainly five years I've been there, it's about everybody having a voice and everybody being able to have an opinion, feeling safe and secure to say, I don't know why that works like that, or shouldn't we do it like that? And it really didn't matter where you are in the organization. The beauty of being at a startup, which I've loved from being at a corporate is, you literally, you can be some, you know, one of the two or three people at the start who are working on the phones who, who can say, actually, um, I've talked to a customer, I don't know why we do this. And they can say it to me, the CEO, and we'll go, that's a really good point. Let's, let's think about how we do that. So everyone feels um, like part of the solution to problems because that's what businesses have. And, and, and if you have greater diversity, you have more angles and different thought processes to solve those problems. And effectively, I think great businesses are businesses that are great at solving problems. Yeah, I agree. Jim, what are your thoughts? Oh, I got so many thoughts on what Oki's been saying. Um, <clears throat> but I, I am interested in just sort of um, whether it's got harder or easier um, in lockdown. We, we had a really good conversation uh, last week, Oki, and we, I was telling you about um, what we do on Thursday mornings with our team, where we, we do one-to-one. -one. So Zoom randomly allocates everyone in our team to somebody else. And you just talk for 10 minutes about whatever you want to talk about. People talk about their childhoods, um, things they love. And it's been really amazing at getting people to know each other kind of outside of the normal tribes of being in the tech team or being in the sales team. Um, and people love it it is literally people's favorite part of the week because they're really getting to know each other. And you, you mentioned um, uh, Donut, I think it was. That's right, yeah. Uh, which, and, and, and tell us about that, because that, that seems like a really interesting solution for remote world. Yeah, um, <laughs> it's, really, it's really interesting. I mean, uh, um, we talked about how your business is this great, great size, the size that I loved actually, you know, now we're like almost 400 people, but I loved it when we were like, 15 people we were one team there were no tribes because there was only 15 people and we were all in one place we didn't even have a meeting room right um so 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 basically everyone got to hear everything right communication wasn't an issue um because it was just all there and then we grew try to keep meeting room doors open we were like hang on we used to hear that conversation from over then you know you'd be having a meeting someone would jibe in from the other side of the room hang on you know this is what i think you think oh no, a good point you know, and then you get bigger and bigger meeting rooms come in, closed doors, all that sort of stuff. And communication gets much more difficult. And then in the virtual world, it got even worse, right? Because people weren't even in the same office. They weren't crossing each other or having that um, that sort of coffee um, coffee conversation. So there is a tool called Donut. And that does it pr pretty much for bigger organizations, I'd say. And it basically randomly uh, connects you with someone every day or every two days you can set it how you like and and it often sets really you know what's your favorite tv show you know what thing are you working on today you know and and it's random so i could be fun enough yesterday i was connected to our new office manager in sweden who's working part-time right you know um i'm not often gonna cross a, uh, come across her by the co uh, by the coffee machine but we had a great conversation actually about meatballs but there you go um you know, it's 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 it is really useful tool just to try and get that little bit of random interaction back into um, back into the workplace because I think that's what how workplaces thrive and although I am a fan um, and I do believe that we'll all have to adjust to more remote working going forward um, you know we've got to find a way of, of, of the human connection remaining you know and actually in, from a well-being perspective I think that helps because you know what's going on for you what's going on for you i'm struggling with this i'm struggling with that helps you feel like you're not on your own i think i don't know what everyone else is thinking sometimes at the moment with this you kind of feel like you're on your own sometimes you know you close the laptop you're on your own no one to you know no one to sort of say yeah oh god this is really really sort of put me under a bit of stress or strain mm. and you know everyone's looking at the future now and, and the future for the sort of office environment um bought by many what are you thinking you're going to be doing in the in terms of sort of remote working semi-remote um yeah we it's quite funny um we i've had a few sessions with other um uh, scale up companies everyone's doing in in the same thought process some are further ahead some have said right no offices at all wow you know um brave courageous 
and they're moving forward and I think it's good to be committed to something I mean I think we all know if you research it that the models that work perhaps best so far are everyone in the office everyone out of the office everyone in the hybrid office mm, we tried it in the middle of last summer I'm sure you all did as well it wasn't it wasn't great you know um you didn't know who was in the office and and when you had your zoom meetings half the people in the office half the people on zoom the, the meeting after the meeting became the problem you know we all we thought on zoom with a meeting when it finishes it finishes for everyone you know um or if you're all in the room it dissipates for everyone right whereas the half and half is the, the meeting was finished the next week you find out well when was that decided well after we finished we had another mm -hmm. conversation and where we decided this, this, and this. Oh, right, I didn't know about that, <laughs> great. Now I'm thinking, next week I've got to go into the office because I want to be in the meeting after the meeting. You know, and I think that's what may actually drive more people back into the office. I think definitely at a management and leadership level, for sure. Um, in direct answer to your question, I think, uh, you know, um, coming back to mindfulness, psychological safety um, and well-being, uh, people being at home has changed almost everything for us. The people's state of mind. I mean, people said, "Oh, the productivity is a, is is only a short term thing," but we found it to be very, very strong. You know, people feel happier. They're they're doing things they'd never done before. You know, I, I personally got, I'm now coaching my son's football team, which is something I've wanted to do for ten years, never been able to do it because I've been too busy with work. But now I'm at home at six o'clock on a Monday and a Wednesday. I can go and do that, and I'm now committed to it. I will not not do it again and so therefore i'm working at home on mondays and wednesdays from now on forever right and so and that helps my psychological oh, oh well my well-being and my mental health for sure you know so i think i think the world has changed right in front of us um i'm not mm. sure exactly how it's going to shake out mm. but i think we have to create environments for people to go to the office if they want um but also not to if they don't want to yeah, that's going to be quite interesting. Um, it, your honesty there was really um, enlightening. And I, as I said at the very beginning, it's interesting that people aren't even, I hadn't thought about the after meeting because I haven't been in a situation where anybody has been in offices. So the idea that there's an after meeting, um, there's an awful lot of um, you know, new things that people are presumably thinking about behind the scenes. Um, one of the last things I was um, curious is that I gather you've taken on a lot of staff um, that, you, that have never come into your office. I've had that situation. In fact, one, one team I'm working with, I haven't met any of them, but I've been working with them for an, a, a year now, and I almost feel if I bump into them in the street, I will know them because we've done so many Zooms several times a week. Um, how have you thought that that has, you know, what, what's that meant for you at, at Bought by Many? Um, I think it's, I think it's hilarious, actually. <laughs> so we've onboarded 120 people since lockdown. That's, that actually doubled the size of our business. Well, so, so half the people in the business, no one has ever really met physically because we don't really ever get back together. That's, that's quite astounding when you think about it. And actually, it's quite funny, actually. One guy, Adam, um, someone said to me the other day, do you know how tall Adam is? I said, I don't know, he looked five, five, eight. No, he's six, five. I'm like, six, five? Because I've only ever seen him from, from here upwards, right? That's Zoom. I had no idea. So if I'd seen him in the street, I maybe wouldn't have recognized him because I would have expected him to be this big. And actually, he's, he's a giant. You know, um, and that's another thing Zoom does. You just got no concept of how tall people are. You wouldn't really know how tall I am because you only see me from mm -hmm. there. Upwards, you know, so um, I, I, I think, and I've worked as one of my direct reports. I've um, I've ne never physically met her. She's been working for me for almost a year. You know, but do you know what? I don't. I don't know everyone. I don't think about it. I just think about us getting the job done the best we can do in the current way of working. And so we've all. I feel like everyone seems to have just adjusted. You know, um, and I think there are many, so many positives about it. Availability, I've, I've met and just had so many discussions with, you know, like even when I was talking to Jim, it was like, uh, can we talk tomorrow? And he, yeah, I can fit you in tomorrow. And, you know, a year ago, that would have been, well, I think you need to talk to someone and we might be able to meet in a couple of weeks, you know, because we'd be thinking physically and, and, and all the rest of it. And so I, I think it's, I personally, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan. I know it's going to need a lot of adjustment, but I think that the, and look, everyone's got their own opinion. I think some of the positives our way, what are definitely also negatives. 
yeah, I think it'll be really nice if we can look at some of the positives that you've brought out. I mean, it's quite interesting in the week of visit the globes that have been taken on this point. No one talks about even that we only ever see that, you, you know, people wearing their shirts up. I think there were a few people collecting big awards this week, just wearing their tracksuit bottoms and, you know, not big red mm -hmm. carpet ceremonies that we've had. So there's going to be so many differences that we're going to need to think about and how to um, fit them in when we you know go back to whatever the new norm is but okay I really liked your ideas of having the positives the things that are working um, and I think we need to all think about building on those in the future because there isn't there was a lot of conversation at the beginning of the first lockdown about losses um, which can still surface a lot but I think we have learned so much and it, I'm really looking forward to going back and actually being able to see some positives and some changes that have needed to be in place for a long time and I think to go full circle around psychological safety it is going to be nice if when we go back into the office we can bring our whole self whatever that means and the differences and some of these donut conversations need to be interwoven into our workplaces um somebody is writing on the chat that very very importantly that um businesses have often assumed it's only the leaders that can solve the problems but as you rightly have pointed out um and from the stuff that gareth was saying earlier that we know that actually people that are talking to the customers are often not somebody that's often in the board meeting or the more senior meetings, but they actually hear what the problem is and can think of a, a solution. So um, that's that's very interesting from my point of view. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just quickly on that, it, it's really powerful. A lot of people like to talk about business as being successful and blah, 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 and it is. And what is what's the secret sauce? How did you do it? And actually we did it by focusing on uh, on customers and the way we focused on customers was to involve the whole business in trying to trying to solve things. And we'd often have um, squad meetings and stuff, and we would take the customer service agents, and they would be the most vocal people in the meeting. You know, don't build that; it doesn't work. Don't get me to do that. I can't do this. When I talk to the customer, they ask this. I can't do it. Build me something that helps me do that, and not. And that means that 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 voice of the customer is really direct and and sort of tied into our business. Um, and uh, they feel great about it, <laughs> you know, that they, they really are changing the business because they are, um, and we do a better job for customers. So win-win. In fact, this win-win yeah. thing, just quickly, I know you probably, is, is a thing. I think that's a massive, massive change. I think we, some of us grew up in this whole GE, Jack Welsh, win-lose, forced rankings, every, you know, and I think that's got to go, that's got to stop, and I think we've got to be about win-win. How can we both win? How can two businesses win? you know, uh, you know, how can we, how can we, we how can we have everybody that overperforms, you, you know, this concept that for, for, te for 10 people to have been brilliant, 10 people have had to have been bad, you know, is terrible for psychological safety and for environment to work and all the rest of it. What, what, why can't 20 people have done well this year, right? Um, and I'm hoping businesses don't do that anymore. We certainly don't do it at our business. And I think it's one of those things that I'm sure we all, when we were doing it 10 years ago, were thinking this is wrong, right? You know, I'm forcing this person to have a bad score when actually they didn't really do that badly, you know? Um, so I just wanted to say that. Well, I, I like the concept of win-win. Um, and as you rightly said, and you've got, you know, from your book, you've written a time at Sainsbury's, it is all about the, the business and the customer. And when there's a win-win, you can't have a business without a customer and the customer needs the business. So I always think that if we, link it back to that in the first place so whether um that, that's the most important thing that we're going to be looking at as we move forward is what works for everybody and there's going to be if nothing else from the conversations we're having today is that there's going to be a lot of change and we've all known in the past we don't like change but if this year has shown us anything is that we can cope with change mm. and we're good and if we allow people to speak up and take everybody's idea as valuable i think it's it's you know going to make a much more comfortable place for us all to be in when Gareth was talking earlier, it reminded me of if you go to a party and you're just stood in the corner because nobody really thinks you should be there and you don't really have a voice and everybody wouldn't really listen to you. It would be a very uncomfortable place to be and you wouldn't go again. If that's what your workplace is like, you're the only person that doesn't have a voice. Why would you want to choose to go there? So I want everybody to get up and want to go to work because they feel valued, which is I'm sure what, what you're saying is um, equally important. Yeah, no, this whole, we've not touched much on belonging and inclusion, but that's at the essence, that's its, at its essence. I feel, I feel like I belong here. I feel, and belonging here feel, means I feel safe, psychologically safe. I feel yeah. that I, I'm listened to when I choose to, but the fact 
but that's about we, we did a thing on introversion you know when i choose to speak i'm listened to but i'm not forced to always speak or i'm not looked down on because i haven't spoken right that's also about belonging you know trying to force people in the old world well they don't say very much or they don't contribute well maybe it's because that's them and to bring themselves to the work they have to bring their introverted self to the workplace too you know so let's smash all these sort of old concepts and i actually think uh, remote working helps with that you know i i, I really do you know allows people to be themselves because often they're in their own space you know so with that that brings um a confidence i think you're right um just to end and i know we need to go back to jim is i always remember sitting in a, a place watching the world go past and then old man sat next to me on the bench said to me there's one of everybody out today and I've always ca captured that phrase. I think it's a really lovely way to say, it. and we need one of everybody. The world is a better place when we have one of everybody being able to be themselves and feeling a sense of belonging and we'll, we'll create a better business thing, family, whatever it be. So thank you very much, Oki, uh, for your thoughts. Zoe, that was lovely. Um, okay, so Oki, do, do stay around. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna say, do join us, um, uh, our lovely audience, if you want to join in. So um, if you can maybe just raise a hand um, uh, at the bottom of your screen. And what Guy will then do is he will um, allow you into the conversation. And if, if we could welcome Gareth back as well, that would be great. Um, and we can just keep going. And anyone who wants to join in can do so. Um, but, uh, Oki, can I just... Um, pick up on a point again we were talking about last week so um i mentioned that we put out a job advert um and someone had applied to it where they were basically taking about a 15 percent pay cut for that job and she said tell me about your culture um because she said i want to go and work somewhere where i feel safe um and she's very talented we've we're we're hiring her um, but it was really interesting to see that was what she was looking for. She was coming from the travel industry, which is very uncertain, very high stress. And you said something to me about someone who you hired recently, and I think it was a mother. Um, and I'll, I'll let you take over because it's, I've been thinking about it ever since you said it. Yeah, it was, um, it wasn't as a father, but, um, well, I, I, as it turned out, um, I think this war for talent thing is just huge, right? Uh, I, by the way, I hate the term because it, it, it's like sabres at dawn and, you know, shooting and, you know, um, but I, th I think it should be, you know, it should be flowers and, and nice things that are going to attract people. I feel safe. I feel calm. I'll go and be able to be, give myself to that organisation. And, and, and I was interviewing uh, this gentleman and he was doing really, really well. And it was like, what questions do you have for me but, you know, at the end of this sort of stuff? And he said, look, I've got two kids under two, right? My life is a strain. What are you going to do to help? me right and i've never been asked that before i mean it was like whoa hang on you have an expectation of rightly so the expectation of how we are going to help you thrive in your very stressful environment anyone's got any have had any young kids you know let alone two under two i'm like oh you know um but working from home two kids under two you know how are you going to help me sort of thing um and this whole idea of uh, I thought it was a great question, it was a super question, and and actually it got me on the back foot. And we were sort of scrambling. Well, we do this, we do that, we do this, we do that, and it just made me think we have to create this environment where people. He wants to bring himself, but he, he's got to know. Sometimes I want to slept, slept, right? You know, uh, it's difficult. I'm going to be crotchety and all of this stuff because it's this environment that I'm living in now. And will you support me in that in that in that way? And and. And actually, I've been thinking about it ever since in the chief people officer. We've been thinking about it ever since because we're like, this is a really good point. He's a brilliant candidate. He'll be asking lots of different people how they help him with his mindfulness, with his um, uh, uh, psychological safety and bringing himself to work. And I think that will be our ability as businesses to answer those questions and show uh, show prospective uh, customer uh, uh, employees how we are going to support them will become more and more and more important, especially with flexible work with working from home. You know, you know, I, I think it's going to be key. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, I mean, is it your assumption that we'll see more and more of that in the future and that employers that can really answer that question well are going to just have a, an advantage in the labour market? Yes. 
Yeah. A hundred percent. You know, I think we also discussed my 17 year old daughter um, who's uh, off to university and she spent ages researching these sort of things and talking to me about, you know, inclusion and belonging and psychological safety and how people are talking about how they're supported and pastoral care. And all. I don't think about any, I don't know about you. I don't think about any of that. I'm like, where are the clubs? Where are the bars? And that's all I need to know about. Um, not, not anymore. Um, and uh, you can call them what you like, but this generation that's coming through, think more about these things, about what, what you do to create an environment for them to thrive. Um, and that's just not about pay. As you said, that's not just about pay anymore. Mm. I think um, your, your daughter that you mention um, fondly, and you know, I think raises a really interesting thing that I've been missing most about going into the office, which is often not um, categorised, or I haven't heard people categorise it, is that in my life, it's no surprise that I live with people that are very similar to me. And the bit that's been really missing for me is I just don't interact with people that I have found help me grow as a person. So I was lucky enough to work for the most fantastic startup company that grew enormously. And when I joined, there were 30 people. And when I left, there were 1,500 people. Mm. But I met one of everybody every day and it helped solve ideas, it brought different um, solutions to problems, it was just an incredibly different way of working. But I, I wonder, um, there's some great conversation and there's a couple of questions that we should look at that are coming in and Suzanne, I think, you know, you, you bring us back to the idea of the global talent because you're saying, you know, you're wanting a three um, day and two day working week of in the office and some people will be offering five days working from home um, and, and it is going to be a problem but I guess one of the things I would um, value other people's thoughts on is we're going to have to work out why people want to come into the office we're probably going to have to turn the question around because people used to say this should be the holy grail for the last 20 years I want to work from home maybe the new question is why do people want to work from the office? Because there will be people and there are things that need to be done. So maybe that's a way of looking at this new problem. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I agree. And we've done a lot of work right from day one with this, um, you know, and what we found last year, I don't know what else when we went through this sort of first stage experiment, when you could kind of go back to the office and Boris was saying, get back to the office, you know, um, and everyone's like, really, why do I need to go back to the office? Mm. Um, and what we found, I'm really happy to hear from it, was people only wanted to go to the office to meet other people. That was it, right? That was the only, they knew they, sorry, let me, we actually did a survey. 5% of people wanted to be in, at home all the time. 5% of people wanted to be in the office all the time. And everyone else was a mishmash somewhere in between. And of the people that wanted to come into the office sometimes, the only real reason they wanted to come into the office now was because they wanted to meet other people. They wanted to chat, they wanted to collaborate, they wanted to innovate and, and that sort of thing. Nothing to do with doing their job. And we've all known for years that the, the best way to do your job is not to do it in the office, right? It's at home or it's in a plane or in somewhere else. You don't want to work in the office. You only want to be around people. And I think that's going to be the paradigm shift. How can we be around people without being in the office? Um, I think you bring up a really, I mean, your stats are great because you've probably done what we've all suggested always in, in well-being as, or office life is ask the people that you work with. So your um, cohort, it's 5% that do, 5% that don't. And then uh, my math is not that good, but I think it's 90% that want to mix. So I think um, I think it's interesting. Most of the stats are saying that, you know, are slightly higher than that. But it comes back to that age old problem of actually just asking your staff what they want. Mm. So this is, I guess, from your point of view, looking at to try and help you with your um, it's not a question, but um, you, you, what you're worrying about is just making sure that you're doing what your guys want. And why do they want to come into the into the office? So. Um, Gareth, I don't know what your thoughts are about that because I know you're, you're doing some good planning about how people are going to go back. Yeah, I think there are a million different views, you know, a little bit in line with, with what Oki just said. You know, you've got your, your sort of ends of the spectrum and then there's a, there's a real mishmash. And I think in terms of asking the question why, yeah, I think, I think you'll get different answers. I think the yes to meet other people, but, but for what purpose? You know, for some people, it's because they live in a little flat and they're, they're sick of looking at the same wall um, or they're sick of the noise from from the neighbor or the, just the lack of ability to so you know feel from a sort of psychological perspective that you're in a different space and that you're doing something different so that's one drive another one might be 
whatever, you're a senior leader and you feel that it's a face-to-face -face business and you want to have some proper conversations that aren't just through a through a web chat maybe it's the after meeting is, is the first meeting you know harking back to the, the prior chat but there, there are different sort of drivers for that it could be collaboration driven i think it's, it's a real challenge i also think there's a, a generational point you know we've touched on that in terms of what 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 you know younger people are expecting demanding when they come through and i i observe that within my own firm which is in financial services you know, I, th I think there's a there's a, a sort of difference in perspective depending on you know where you are in your career what what you've been used to uh, and what you know you've seen work for yourself versus you know perhaps what other people think in terms of being a little bit more open-minded to to this being a paradigm shift so i'm i'm curious you know we've done lots of planning but we, we've not yet sort of delivered the punchline i think i think probably like a lot of firms there's been a lot of planning going on but people are sort of waiting cautiously to see what what are others going to come out with, right? Because if you get this wrong to, uh, to the point you were making, Zoe, you, you put yourself in a very difficult position, I think, vis-a-vis -vis the talent market. Um, so no, I'm, I'm a fascinated, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of involved, but I'm a fascinated observer at the same time. Mm. I also think, Gareth, I mean, I, I agree with you, but it's going to be very hard as an employer when someone asks you the question, do I have to come to the office five days a week for you to say, yes, you do. You know, I, I think it'd be brave organisations who who say that, especially in the tech world with developers, and they'll be like, "Really? What? I have to come to the office five days a week?" I don't think so. You yeah. know, um, so I think everyone. I've heard some saying, "Oh, we're not. We're going to go back five days a week." I'm like, "Good luck," because I'm just not sure that's going to work. Yeah, and no, I agree. I think there'll be industry trends as well as you mentioned, especially in tech. As yes, old school industries. I know. I think they're sort of waiting and seeing, and it, it, yes, I think I think the reaction might surprise some of those leaders if they do come out with that as a as a sort of mandate. Hmm. I think I think the the key, the key point you've made there, Gareth, is just the sort of <clears throat> everyone has a different perspective, and it's just like well being. You know, we talk about this a lot, Zoe, when about the need for choice um, because there is no one size fits all solution to this. It's very very personal. So. Um, you know, if you come in with a one size fits all solution saying everyone in the office five days a week, you're going to lose a lot of people on that. Similarly, if you say fully remote, there will be some people going, I need to get out of my bedroom. I need to do some social interaction. And I think the, the, where we're starting to look at it as a business is actually applying the same logic as well-being and saying, all right, let's really understand this is very personal. Everyone has a really different set of needs here. How can we as an employer offer very flexible solutions to meet whatever their needs are um, and and that's a really different mindset actually for an employer than the traditional model of yeah you're all coming into the office guys um, and <clears throat> as, as we talked about it you know people were saying I need social interaction I need to get out of my room but what what we noticed was they would say I don't necessarily need to see my colleagues um, I just need to see people and, and it mm. might be that I'm going to a shared office space near my house, which is five minutes walk away, where I get to know other people there. Um, and actually, those who've worked in shared offices will know that you make a lot of friends in other companies in those shared offices. And that can be really can be often the most healthy friendships, actually. So it's um, I think it's what's going to be fascinating is seeing actually of all the, the kind of much more tailored approaches that come out. And those may be the employers that can really hoover up the talent um, going forward. It's going to put it's going to put business planning um, to a new level, I think, Jim. I mean, putting both things into perspective. So you've got the psychological safety of people being able to speak up and say what they want and how it's going to be important for them to perform well, set against business objectives, which we do have to remember, as, as you know, we rightly know that some people have gone into work through the whole of the pandemic. And as I said in an, a, an earlier um, piece, that it's going to be interesting when uh, people who have been furloughed for the same company where people have been working full time, that's often not mentioned. So there's going to be so many um, things that are going to be into play when everybody, when the world opens back up in June. So um, it's been an interesting time. I think all of these conversations that we're having um, are, you know, obviously going to really help us think about these things, a sense of belonging. So we want to belong to the organization that we work for, whether that's at home or in the office mm. and having psychological safety to make sure that we feel that is gonna become increasingly important. And Jim, I, I fully agree with what you say around 
choice and, and, mm. and working out how that there is a choice but putting the business piece into that choice too because there is a reason that we are there in the first place and keeping that 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 common goal uh, ready um so so that that's my thoughts i don't know what anybody else is thinking you know one thing i would say is no one knows is what gareth said, no one knows the answer to this right no one no one's got the answer there is no there is no answer yet right we're all we're all busking we're all trying to find out what the solution is and i think what you guys are doing creating forums for conversations are, is going to be fundamental. I've been trying to hat, latch into as many as I can to get as many perspectives from as many people as I can, you know, because I don't know the answer. There is no answer. It's almost the first time ever in certainly my working career where no, literally no one, you talk to, you know, someone at Google, they'll give you one answer. Talk to someone at Facebook, they'll give you another answer. Talk to someone else, that uh, they'll give you a different answer. You know, Apple, they'll give you a different answer. We're all trying to work out the answer and I'm sure the answer won't be the same for all of us right but I, I personally I'm finding t listening to as many people as possible helps me to get to what will be the solution for our business yeah and I think there's an interesting comment on the chat that somebody um has rightly said that they're looking forward to seeing what Anna Gale is looking forward to seeing what the technology companies um can help put into place to work out you know how you keep that um water cooler chat going and one of the things I say to you Oki is and I'm sure you you know whichever form of chat you use I know that when I worked for the uh, you know the tech startup I found slack fascinating and it wasn't the slack channels that you might necessarily it was the chat channels because you could learn a lot about what's going on in your organization and people's feelings by in infiltrating and talking to people on those channels really that was often where people were very honest about what they were feeling so while i think it's nice to look and see what we're all doing in different companies i really like the idea that you'd surveyed your guys so you knew what your percentages were of what they wanted to do because as we all know some companies will want to go back and there'll be 65 percent will want to be in the offices and another company like yours only five percent want to be there so i think as jim says choice is going to be choice in knowing what works for you i guess is going to be the way forward yeah well listen um this is such an important conversation i love it it is probably the most important conversation we're all having at the moment um so it's been hugely valuable to hear um, all of your views um, today. Thank you so much for uh, coming in. Thank you to our audience for asking some great questions. I hope you've all found it um, uh, interesting and put a spring in your step, which is what we try and do with uh, Wellbeing Works. Um, our next event is in April, can't remember what date. Um, we're going to be looking at uh, what works in, in well-being. Um, so what are the things that actually deliver, help people and deliver value? Um, so, yeah, thank you again uh, from me. And I'm sure thank you from Zoe too. Um, <clears throat> look forward to staying in touch and, and stay well. Take care, everyone. Bye. Thanks, guys. Bye.